Hear me, demigods, my children beloved. Make of thyselves that which ye desire, be it a lord, be it a god. But should ye fail to become aught at all, ye will be forsaken, amounting only to sacrifices. The Erd Tree governs all. The choice is thine. Become one with the Order, or divest thyself of it. To wallow at the fringes, a powerless upstart, let a new epoch begin. An epoch glistening with life. Brandish the Elden Ring for the age of the Erd Tree. The lands between are a realm that is home to many a legendary and powerful figure, and as the Tarnished, we get to rub shoulders with these giants, even if they have seen better days. Yet at the centre of it all is Queen Marika the Eternal, the god of the world and the vessel for the Elden Ring. For the mystery of the game starts with the opening cinematic that declares that Queen Marika is missing. It is she who ushered in the age of the Erd Tree through bloodshed and battle, and symbolised an era of bounty under its bows. Marika's hand is felt everywhere in the lands between, through her children and through an entire culture that has been built around her image and God-given authority. Yet the grandeur of the Erd Tree and the realm of Marika would not last forever, despite that being the intention. Marika's duty was an immense burden and to understand Marika is to understand the incredible stress that she must have faced over hundreds, if not thousands of years. The flaws of the Golden Order and the machinations of others had chipped at the foundations of the world, and the final blow would be delivered by Marika herself. With a swing of her hammer, Marika destroyed herself and the Elden Ring, leaving the world crooked, broken and without leadership. Yet despite these immutable facts, and spending hundreds of hours surrounded by her statues, Marika remains one of the most enigmatic characters in the entire game, and multiple questions will always remain. So join me this week as we examine the Erd Tree and Marika, the god of an epoch. And I'm really excited to bring you this video, as I find both of these subjects some of the more difficult to comprehend in the entire game. And to that end, I've referenced the work of other great content creators throughout this video, such as Eridan, Xyostorm, Ashen Hollow, Quelag, and Last Protagonist, the latter even being kind enough to provide me with some translations for certain pivotal items. I think for subjects like this, we are enriched by drawing upon each other's work, much like traditional scholarship, especially since the lore of Elden Ring encompasses such a large breadth of themes and ideas so consider checking out these creators below, as they are all fantastic members of this community, and their views and perspectives on these subjects has helped round out my perception of this subject matter. And before we carry on guys, remember that if you enjoy Elden Ring lore, then please like the video and subscribe to the channel. I now have hours of lore content for you to dig into, and plenty more to come. I have decided to structure this video by first of all exploring the origins of the Erd Tree, before then tying it together with a history and analysis of Marika in the latter part of the video. The origins of the Elden Ring's influence upon the world began with the coming of the Elden Beast, something we learn via the Elden Star's incantation, which reads as follows. It is said that long ago, the Greater Will sent a golden star bearing a beast into the lands between, which would later become the Elden Ring. The Elden Beast would then become the Elden Ring, and thus would begin the primordial age of the dragons, where the ancient dragons would rule on behalf of the Greater Will. The setup of this rule is very similar to what we see in Marika's era, a god and an Elden Lord. This is something we learn from the remembrance of the Dragon Lord, which shows that Placidusax was the Elden Lord to a god that we don't know much about. Indeed, we can even see what appears to be a more primordial version of the Elden Ring engraved in Far Mazilla, the capital of the Dragon Civilization. And this engraving of the Elden Ring in a different form just reinforces what we really know already and what we'll explore in this video, that the Elden Ring's power has changed form 
over time. In the modern era, it is represented by the Erd tree, and the Erd tree, of course, has its origins in the Crucible. Now, whether this engraving of the Elden Ring found in Farmazula is representative of the Crucible or of an earlier version of the Elden Ring is unknown and not really that particularly relevant for this video. The main important takeaway is, of course, that the Elden Ring has changed over time. And now let us go back to the Crucible so we can understand the origins of the Erd Tree. It is a basic piece of lore, but the Crucible is an earlier form of the Erd Tree. I'm sure most people understand that by this stage in the game's history. But let's cover it anyway. So it's something we learn of via the Godskin Noble set, and it reads the following. Not unlike the Crucible, the Erd Tree in its primordial form. This means that to understand the Erd Tree, we must first of all look at the Crucible, as they are essentially two evolutionary stages of the same force. The timeline in Elden Ring is not extremely clear, but I believe the era of the Crucible overlaps with both the prehistoric era of the dragons and the early era of the Erd Tree. I think this idea can be supported by some imagery we find in Faramazula, and shout out to Quelag who made this connection in one of her videos, and I will link the relevant video below. In Faramazula, there are reliefs in certain parts of the area that have some interesting implications. These reliefs seem to show a tree flanked by two unusual looking creatures, who to me must either be some kind of dragonkin, or as Quelag suggests, misbegotten. As shown by the description of Siluria's spear, as well as the actual imagery of the weapon itself and her helmet, appears to depict the crucible as a sort of wild and natural looking tree. And given the crucible is the primordial form of the Erd tree, this makes perfect sense. The crucible is distinctly linked to the greater will and the power of the Elden Ring, a period of red gold rather than pale gold of the Erd tree and golden order. The idea of red gold being used as an indicator of the Crucible's influence is an idea that we can learn from the Gilded Great Shield, which reads the following, Metal Great Shield coated with gold, carried by knights loyal to Godric. The red tinge in the gold coat mirrors the primordial matter that became the Erd Tree, the colour of homeward yearning. The nature of this gold is interesting because the two different colours of gold tie it back to an allegiance with the greater will, but the different shading of red and pale symbolise two different eras of golden rule, a point well made by Ordovis's great sword, which reads the following. This sword is imbued with an ancient holy essence. Its red tint exemplifies the nature of primordial gold, said to be close in nature to life itself. The red tint of the gold seems to be symbolic of the themes of primeval life that we often see associated with the Crucible, hence why we see this gold adorning the Crucible Knight's armour and weapons. And thematically, the red gold ties in here with the idea of life, life being closely associated with the Age of the Crucible, something we will again examine when we come to the Age of Abundance chapter, an overlapping period between the Crucible era and the Erd Tree era. The evolution from crucible to Erd tree, from wild life to refined life, explains the differences between earlier greater will beliefs versus those of the Golden Order, and in turn leads us to understand why the Golden Order views the worship of the crucible as a more primitive worship of life and the greater will. The item description of the Gilded Shield of course calls into question Godric's beliefs given that it is a shield wielded by his soldiers, that he is linked to Godfrey, a lord more in tune with the Crucible, and he also venerates dragons, and the fact he blends together life in an artificial sense via grafting. But this of course is an analysis and a story for another video. As we already discussed, gold was a signifier of the Greater Will's power in this time, and while it was red gold, it is nonetheless kin to the paler gold of later eras and later Golden Order incantations. And indeed we learn of the kinship and ties between the red gold of ancient dragon lightning and the pale gold of modern Erd Tree worship via the gravel stone seal which reads as follows. The worship of the ancient dragons does not conflict with belief in the Erd Tree, 
After all, this seal and lightning itself are both imbued with gold, creating a bridge between these more primeval eras and the age of the Earth Tree. One is an evolution of the other. For all intents and purposes, they are both tools of the greater will. The very fact ancient dragons wield the red gold in their lightning powers just reinforces that they were the chosen of the greater will at this earlier stage. And again, to me, it could imply that the crucible may have existed in the time of the ancient dragons, although the timeline is not very clear. However, we do have to remember that the crucible is a force where all life was once blended together. It is therefore possible that primeval life emerged from this churn, including the dragons. Very possible, though it is not without its problems, and it is something I will analyse in my upcoming Crucible video. The main point of understanding to take from this chapter is that the Elden Ring is the force which governs the rules of this world's domain, and has done so since the prehistoric era of the dragons, the age of the Crucible, and thus the Erd Tree. These ages are all defined and linked by one single power, the power of the Elden Ring, and thus as we get into the Erd Tree proper, we must understand that the Erd Tree is just the latest extension of the Elden Ring, a way for the Greater Will to exert their power over the lands between, just as the Crucible before that. So time has always been tricky in Souls games, so how long ago are these past events? How long does the timeline stretch? While it isn't necessary to bog yourself down in these specifics, I do find it an interesting and rewarding idea to ponder. We've already seen that the Empire of the Ancient Dragons is referred to as the Prehistoric Era, and just for reference the term Prehistoric is coming from the Dragon Shield Talismans that you can find different varieties of. And that can give us some ideas in regards to timescales if we relate it to our real world as an allegorical comparison. For us, prehistory is the time of human history before humanity began writing, began documenting history. And that documentation can take any form from writing, inscriptions, paintings or symbolism, any type of creative medium or tool meant to commemorate past events. And effectively, in our world, this is a huge period that starts about 3 million years ago, but only ended about 5,000 years ago. And so for me, the most reasonable view of this time span is to view the reign of the dragons as several millennia ago, probably even more. The Erd Tree had not been born from the Crucible, its primordial form, and the dragons wielded the power of the Elden Ring, as we can see from their red gold lightning, and the fact that they had the Elden Lord and God of this era. Regardless, it is clear that this was a far different era of Elden Ring rule, with the form of the Elden Ring being far different from what we're used to in the modern era, quote unquote. Yet much like Marika's reign, the rule of the dragons would come to a close, and I do think it is within the scope of this video to at least touch upon this subject. We know from Plusedusax's remembrance that the god of this era disappeared, and it is no doubt this that played a key factor in their society's collapse. And originally this chapter on the dragons was much more robust, but given the size of this video, as you will see, I really had to tone it down as there was a lot of bloat in this video, but suffice it to say I will cover the history of the dragons in a later video. But for whatever reason, the dragon god fled and Plusidiusax would hide beyond time. And between that reign and Marika's reign, we don't know of any other Elden Lords or any other gods in that period. And it is my belief that between these two reigns, there was a little bit of a power vacuum, which explains why we see a multitude of different civilizations clearly at different times having risen and fallen in this period. And with that said, we'll move on to the next chapter where we try and assess this pre archery era. As mentioned in the previous chapter, it's unclear whether the dragons ruled all the way up to the period known as the Age of the Erd Tree, but my suspicion is that they fizzled out quite a bit before the emergence of the Erd Tree, leaving a period without a god and Elden Lord, where the Crucible was the main force in the world. This is of course my speculation, but I base it off the fact there's plenty of evidence of plenty different communities arising in the years prior to the Erd Tree's rule. I believe there's a good bit of carbon dating in Elden Ring if we look at certain events, 
and this is one that I've referenced before in my videos, and that is the War of the Ice Dragons and the Fire Giants, as explained by Borealis's Mist. And I believe this is a good bit of supporting evidence that there was a good length of time between the fall of the Age of the Dragons and the rise of the Age of the Erd Tree. The reason I believe this is because the war was fought by the Ice Dragons, who are a species of what we know as modern dragons. We learn of the differences between modern and ancient dragons from items such as the Lightning Strike and Dragon Wound Grease. In short, modern dragons are the bipedal, more wyvern-like dragons like Aegil, Borealis and Smarag. These are dragons who have descended from the stone-like, quadrupedic, ancient dragons and have lost their immortality due to the loss of the gravel stone scales. The fact that these derivative and modern species of dragons were the ones to war with the fire giants, who themselves would overlap with the early age of the Erd Tree, is an interesting point of history for me. I see the modern dragons as a degenerate devolution that must have come about through the collapse of their empire and their association with the Elden Ring. This is my speculation of course, but the very fact the fire giants were able to carve out their own territory and defeat an entire branch of dragon kind without any retaliation from the Elden Dragon Lord, to me simply suggests that the Dragon Empire was a thing long since past by this stage, and is a great indicator of a sort of timeline given we know that the fire giants would be at the zenith of their power at the beginning of the Age of the Erd Tree. And I do think it makes sense given how long we are talking about. We are talking about moving from a primeval, prehistoric era of a world, moving into an era that is more aligned with the medieval era, and I'm of course referring to the Lingdale civilization of the Erd Tree. And to me there are clear indicators that there have been many other early civilizations that have risen and fallen within the timeline, and they would only really fit in the gap between the Age of the Dragons and the gap between the Age of the Erd Tree. We of course have the ancient civilization who built the Ul and Uld palaces, and the mausoleum that would then become the Mogwin Palace. Given the architectural similarities to real world Sumerian and ancient Greek civilizations, the implication of these architectural choices and influence to me is meant to imply that this is a civilization well in the past before the rise of Lane Dell, which again reflects a more modern medieval era. And this is not to mention the fact that it is actually referred to as an ancient civilization in the Mogwin Palace map. Again, we have had two different terminologies used for different time periods, the prehistoric age of the dragons and the ancient era of the Uld and Ul palaces. However you look at the timeline, it becomes undeniable that there were cultures that grew up and developed separate from the influence of the Erd Tree. As such, they developed their own ideas practices and worship their own gods, and conceived their beliefs outside what we know to be as the norm during the reign of Marika. A good example of this idea is rooted in an actual bit of in-game lore and not my own waffle, and this is found in the Sorcery Explosive Ghost Flame item description, which reads as follows. In the time when there was no Erd Tree, death was burned in Ghost Flame. Death birds were the keeper of that flame. So the Death Birds and the Twin Bird deserve their own video and analysis of course, but they and their associated beliefs are a great illustration of a world without an Erd Tree, when Death was completely divorced from it. And building upon this, for a further example of a community and culture that has clearly developed their own beliefs and practices surrounding Death, we can of course look to the Ancestral Follower community. This culture has a wholly different burial and funerary practice free from the dominion and domination of the Erd Tree. Indeed, these are more than just beliefs, as their beliefs on death and rebirth are made manifest in the form of their ancestor spirits. The remembrance of the regal ancestor reads as follows. Ancestral spirits exist as a phenomenon beyond the purview of the Erd Tree. Life sprouts from death as it does from birth. Such is the way of the living. Indeed, even in the corpses of these ancestral beings that we find in the areas of the ancestral followers, we can see new life forming from their remains. 
flora budding in a perfect display of the cycle of life and death, a cycle that is free from the Erdtree burial of Marika's era. And I think we have hit here on an important point, as we now understand why the arrival of the Erdtree was not welcomed with open arms. These are practices of death and life that have nothing to do with the Erdtree and are completely separate by it, and the Erdtree would be a threat to that way of life. And with that understanding, let us look at the protection of the Erdtree incantation, which reads the following. In the beginning, everything was in opposition to the Erdtree, but through countless victories in war, it became the embodiment of order. Everything was in opposition to the Erdtree, and now we can start to understand why. Entire societies, communities, and cultures had risen up with their own practices, gods, religion, and their own ways of understanding death. So the arrival of the Erdtree would be a massive tyrannical force, in respect of your own beliefs and practices. Instead of being allowed to burn your dead in ghost flames, or bury them, or honour your ancestral spirits, Erdtree burial would replace that and be seen as the only true way of honouring death. Erdtree burial, which is essentially becoming one with the great tree, being absorbed by its roots in a horrible convergence of life and rebirth that would remove any reverence or individuality from the burial process. And indeed, when Marika is the representative of the Erdtree, it is made extremely clear that the Erdtree is the only way of governing life. And if you do not get with the program, you will be excluded to the ends of the Earth. In Marika's own words, the Erdtree governs all. The choice is thine. Become one with the Order. Or divest thyself of it. To wallow at the fringes, a powerless upstart. I really like this quote because it illustrates the fact that the Erdtree and Marika really became to represent a dominant world power with no contenders and no flexibility. It is worth bearing in mind that the worship of Marika, the Erdtree and the Fingers exists beyond the lands between. And this is something we learn from the Church Confessor armor set which reads, the churches outside the lands between, dedicated to the teachings of the two fingers, send confessors out to follow the guidance of grace. The churches outside the lands between. So be in no doubt about Marika's intention at this early stage. The Erdtree will govern all, or your existence will be that of an outcast. And this does line up nicely with what we actually see in-game. For those who do not fit within the established order do actually exist in the fringes. We have the ancestor followers, the misbegotten, those of the Halig Tree, the Omen and the Albanorix. All of these people are pushed to the fringes of the lands between, unwelcome and oppressed, struggling to preserve their own ways of life. And for a large group of the outcasts, one of the main unifying themes is the Crucible. But to answer the question as to why the reason behind the people of the Crucible being ostracised, we must go to the heart of what the Erdtree represents in comparison to the Crucible. So with that said, let us move on to the next chapter, where we attempt to answer the question, what actually is the Erdtree? Let us backtrack slightly now and discuss the evolution of the Crucible into the Erdtree that would trigger the events leading up to what we know as the Age of the Erdtree at the conclusion of the War with the Giants. In the first chapter, we have already examined that in the Godskin Noble set, that the Crucible is defined as the primordial form of the Erdtree. And so it's time to address what this actually means and how it can inform our understanding of the Erdtree's form and function. Let us examine what is meant by primordial from Oxford languages. Their definition in regards to biology is the earliest stage of development. And so this just reinforces what we've already said a number of times, that the crucible is the Erdtree, just at an earlier stage in its life cycle. And revisiting the gilded Great Shield item description, we then understand that the energies found within the crucible would coalesce and eventually form the Erdtree, a new form that would replace what we knew as the crucible. My belief is that the power of the Elden Ring, funneled into the chaotic matter of the Crucible, 
would grow and solidify into the Erd Tree that would then rise from its primordial form to dominate the skyline of the lands between. And as already discussed in the prior chapters, as evidenced by Siluria's weapons and her armour adornments, the Crucible did actually take the form of a sort of tree prior to being named the Erd Tree. And so I find this interesting because of the recent debates and ideas that have come up in the community regarding the two halves of the Erd Tree. And if you aren't sure of what I mean by this, I'm referring to the fact that there's like a golden magical outer layer to the Erd Tree, and then there's the inner, more traditional wooden tree, including the great tree roots that go below the catacombs. Creators like Xyostorm, Sekiro, Dubi, and Quelag have highlighted there are clear differences in the Erd Tree, where it appears to be split between two different forms, a clearly more organic tree in the middle, and a bright gold encasement, which Quelag equates to being more like the gravel stone hide of ancient dragons. We know there are lots of references to an Erd Tree and a Great Tree, with the Great Tree being more associated with the roots and more natural looking part of the tree. And this is something we can learn via the Root Resin item description, which reads, Resin secreted from the roots of the Great Tree can also be found near trees on the surface. The roots of the Great Tree were once linked to those of the Erd Tree, or so they say, and it is for this reason catacombs are built around Great Tree roots. I think it's clear that the Great Tree facet of the Erd Tree is certainly more associated with death, whereas the aspect of the Erd Tree, the more ethereal part, is the source of all life, as described by items like the Albanoric Blood Clot. Together they are the metaphysical form of the Elden Ring's power, though I admit the game does not make it easy to understand the relationship between the Great Tree and the Erd Tree, and what this maybe has to do with the Crucible, this chaotic, traditional organic tree, growing into what we know as the Erd Tree. Yet is it possible the answer is right in front of us, right in front of the Erd Tree, in the form of the giant plaque that hangs over the entrance to the inner sanctum of the Erd Tree? Now, what I see on this engraving is the Elden Ring at the roots, in the middle we have another tree which could be the great tree or interchangeably the crucible and then growing out of that at the top of the plaque is the Erd tree. Now again I refer you to the last protagonist's video on the great tree and golden order where they identify that contrary to what some believe great tree does actually exist in the Japanese but that it is actually synonymous with the Erd tree. To me they are parts of the one whole and the engraving gives us all the answers that we need, in my opinion. We spoke of how the Crucible of Life was clearly connected to the Elden Ring, and that it influenced the growth of the Erd Tree from the Crucible. And to me, what we're seeing here is the Erd Tree growing from that original organic tree of the Crucible that's now known as the Great Tree, but in totality, this is just one form that we know as the Erd Tree. And going further with the idea that the Earth Tree is both the underlying organic tree and the glowing outer case, we can look at the symbolism associated with the Earth Tree. It always includes these roots. They are a part of the Earth Tree. But I encourage you to go and watch Last Protagonist's video, where he aptly describes how the Great Tree and Earth Tree are both separate yet synonymous. And it will hopefully help you close the book on this conundrum. But despite having grown from the Crucible, the Erd Tree differs quite starkly from the rule of the Crucible, and this is something stumbled upon by the Golden Order Fundamentalists, and it's ideas that I discuss in more detail in my Golden Order video, so I recommend that you go and watch that. One of the main laws of the Golden Order is regression, an idea that is well explained by Last Protagonist in his Great Tree video, but in summary, regression towards the mean is a real-world statistical analysis that posits that over time and generations, statistical outliers will pull towards the mean. The example Last Protagonist uses to describe this phenomena is when two above average height parents have a child, that child is more likely to pull towards the mean and be shorter than their parents and closer to the average height. In the world of Elden Ring, 
This idea can be used to explain the philosophical difference between those of the Erdtree and those of the Crucible, and why it would result in the persecution and expulsion of the latter. The Crucible is symbolic of a primeval era of wild, diverse life, but when the Erdtree emerges, life is coalesced into a single immutable symbol. As the incantation of the Law of Regression states, regression is the pool of meaning that all things yearn eternally to converge. To me this is what the Erdtree represents, life converged into a single source, and as such we begin to see why those of the Crucible would be persecuted. The modern Golden Order represents life refined, converged, and more order, as the Erdtree is itself a singular source of life, rather than the uncouth, primordial, diverse life of the Crucible. And viewing the Crucible as a more primitive era is best described by the Crucible Knot Talisman, which reads as follows. A vestige of the Crucible of Primordial Life. Born partially of devolution, it was considered a signifier of the divine in ancient times, but is now increasingly disdained as an impurity as civilization has advanced. This advancement is the refinement of life in the form of the Erdtree, and therefore the unrefined, chaotic vestiges of the Erdtree era have no place in the modern order, and are thus pushed to the fringes. The Erdtree therefore takes the place of the Crucible as the focal point of life in the lands between, as well as acting as a pylon for the Elden Ring's power. It is the central nexus of the Elden Ring's governing power, and this is why Corrin refers to the Erdtree as the source of the Golden Order. The Erdtree, heart of the Golden Order, lies before our very eyes. The Erdtree is a powerful manifestation of Elden Ring energy, a focal point for its power, and I think this becomes clear when you look at the evidence that suggests that the Elden Ring, Elden Beast, Marika, and the Erdtree are all intrinsically connected. Consider, for example, the Erdtree avatars, who can actually wield the same powers as the Elden Beast. The avatars are part of the Erdtree, and the fact they are manifesting the same powers as the Elden Beast is something to consider. But the most obvious bit of evidence that these are all connected is the fact that when the Elden Ring is shattered, so too are the Elden Beast, the Erdtree, and Marika herself. I think the design of the Elden Beast itself is also meant to allude to the connection between the two, and that the Erdtree is a manifestation of its will. For if the Elden Beast jumps above the waters, you can see it has root-like tendrils attached to its tail. And indeed, this idea of connections and links is something backed up by the incantation The Law of Causality, and I feel like the more we examine the Golden Order and the Erdtree, we begin to understand why these are laws of the Golden Order. For example, the Law of Causality incantation reads the following. Causality is the pool between meanings, that which links all things in a chain of relation. And we begin to see that the Earth Tree is a nexus for the laws of regression and the laws of causality. It is a convergence nexus, as well as something that is connected to the other aspects and vessels of the Elden Ring. And we can tentatively extend this idea of connections when we look at the two fingers. Xylstorm has made some interesting revelations in his video discussing the themes of mushrooms found within Elden Ring. And while I'm not fully in on the entire game being about mushrooms, I find his analysis of the two fingers in a mycelial network very interesting and compelling. In the video, Xylstorm makes the comparison of trees being connected to mushrooms through a mycelial network, and that the two fingers might be connected to the Erd tree in this manner, to convey and communicate the will of the Greater Will and the Erd Tree. And again, this reinforces the idea that the Erd Tree is some sort of cosmic nexus or pylon, and the two fingers are the connected vessels through which the Erd Tree communicates. It's a really thought-provoking video, and I will link the full video below, and I recommend you go watch it. Regardless, I think this explanation of the two fingers being connected to the Erd Tree directly fits especially given that we have evidence that their deterioration is linked to that of the Erd Trees. 
and this is something suggested by a dialogue from Vary. I believe that when the Elden Ring was shattered, the two fingers were corrupted, their guidance skewed. And the description of the Lord's Divine Fortification. Now, the nature of the Erd Tree and the way that it operates and the way its internal space operates is clearly not normal. Being connected to the Elden Beast and the Elden Ring obviously has brought some cosmic elements to this tree, quote unquote. For example, we have the Ring Table Hold, which exists outside this world according to the tutorial notes in the game. Indeed, this place appears to be a copy of a real world space, the physical Round Table Hold found in Lane Dell. Now, I'm going to credit a really great spot to my friend Eredin that he made in his in-depth lore playthrough of Elden Ring, where he spotted that in some tapestries of the Erd Tree in Lane Dell, you can see this kind of building entwined within the upper branches of the Erd Tree. And I agree with Eredin's speculation that this could well be a representation of our Round Table Hold, a manifested space created by the Erd Tree, which has an unusual relationship when it comes to time and space. This was a really great find, and I highly recommend that you check out Erdin's lore through if you enjoy an in-depth analysis of lore and environmental details. And this makes sense that the space burns at the same time that we burn the Erd Tree, as it is a space that is created and generated by the power of the Erd Tree, and so when the tree burns, this created space also burns. The Erd Tree's cosmic nature is of course taken to the next level when we actually get to see its interior, quote unquote. And it may be that we see the interior of the Erd Tree sooner than you might realise. The introductory cinematic appears to show our Tarnished waking up within an Erd Tree dimension, as it looks exactly the same as the Erd Tree interior that we see later before being transported into the lands between, after Grace resurrects us from our death. Suggesting the Erd Tree is a confluence of time and space, a dimensional rift that we don't fully understand, but makes perfect sense given the cosmic origins of the Elden Beast and the Greater Will, which actually gave the Erd Tree its form. I think this is further backed up by the way in which we enter the central cortex of the Erd Tree at the end of the game. We don't just walk in, we appear to be pulled in by a golden rift before materialising in the central space of the tree, again emphasising its cosmic origins and the way it deals with time and space. Further to this is of course the final battle between ourselves and the Elden Beast, where it seems to transport us to some kind of different dimension, where we can see multiple Erd Tree-like forms in the distance. I won't pretend to fully comprehend what this means exactly, nor are we supposed to, but clearly the intention of this space is to make us understand that the world of Elden Ring is far greater than the physical world that we perceive in the lands between, and that to understand that the Erd Tree acts as a nexus to the cosmic realm from which the Elden Beast and probably the Greater Will hail. In addition, it is to let you know there is a cosmic element to this story considering players may have missed the likes of Astel and Rani's storyline in general. It makes us feel small in the face of the Greater Will's true nature, and perhaps it is meant to imply a many worlds theory, that this is just one dimension, one parallel world, all connected by Erd Trees and all dominated by the Greater Will. Of course this is just speculation, and really the purpose of this is to make us realise that we are at the mercy of cosmic powers far beyond our comprehension, and that the Erd Tree is a nexus for that power. The final subject I'd like to touch on in this chapter is the Erd Tree as we see it today, as it will become clear as we discuss Marika's reign that the Erd Tree was once a more complete and perfect form. Indeed, as observed by my friend Last Protagonist in his excellent video on the Great Tree, which I've referenced about three times now, the Erd Tree of today is different than what we see in the idealised depictions of it in paintings and in the symbolism of Lanedale forces. In these idealised depictions, such as the paintings in Round Table Hold, or again the iconography of Lanedale forces, the Erd Tree seems to have been straight up and unblemished. 
whereas the tree now is quite tilted off its base and riddled with cracks and scars. So it seems as though the Ur tree was once a more perfect, complete and upright vision. And the Ur tree of today, while stunning to us, is far past its prime. And I think the idea of the Ur tree being way past its prime is reinforced by the Crimson Seed Talisman item description, which reads as follows. The Ur tree was once perfect and eternal, and thus was it believed that Ur tree seeds could not exist. And earlier in the video I mentioned that the shattering of the Elden Ring was what damaged the Ur tree alongside Marika and the Elden Beast, and proof for that comes from the Golden Seed item description, which reads as follows. When the Elden Ring was shattered, these seeds flew from the Ur tree, scattering across the various lands, as if life itself knew that its end had come. And previously I spoke of how when Marika shattered the Elden Ring, she appeared to shatter herself, as well as the Elden Beast, and indeed these cracks also seem to line up with what we see on the Erd Tree's bark now, seeing that it has been irreparably damaged by Marika's actions, no longer in its perfect, upright and immutable form. So while we can definitely attribute some of the damage to the Erd Tree to the shattering of the Elden Ring, there is of course another massive event regarding the Elden Ring that may have contributed to the Erd Tree's tilt, and that is the confinement and removal of the Rune of Death from the Elden Ring. I find this to be important because the role in which the roots of the Erd Tree play in the cycle of life that the Erd Tree governs. We know from various sources that death is associated with the roots of the Great Tree that were once attached to the Erd Tree. Now it's key to look at the root resin where it says the roots of the Great Tree were once linked to those of the Erd Tree, meaning that they are no longer linked to those of the Erd Tree. And clearly being disconnected from its very roots, the things that root it to the earth, could cause it to tilt or lean. But why is this linked to the removal of the Rune of Death? Well, as we've already said, the Erd Tree and the Elden Ring are intrinsically linked. When Marika shatters the Elden Ring, she damages herself and the Erd Tree and the Elden Beast. Does it not therefore make sense that if a part of the Elden Ring was removed, the Rune of Death, part of the Erd Tree, would be removed to reflect the change in this new form of the Elden Ring. And what is the part of the Erd Tree that governs death? The roots. And so is it possible that when the Rune of Death was removed from the Elden Ring, so too were the roots removed from the Erd Tree, and now we have an age of endless death, where Erd Tree burials do not work anymore, and no one is absorbed up into the Erd Tree, it's just stagnated, and that's why we see these half-absorbed corpses in the Erd Tree catacombs. This is just my speculation based on what we know between the connection of the Elden Ring and the Erd Tree. But the term once connected to the roots of the Great Tree has always fascinated me and has always led me to ponder why was the Erd Tree disconnected from the roots of the Great Tree? And given they are involved with death, it makes sense to link it to the removal of the Rune of Death. So to conclude about the Erd Tree, what are we really saying that it is? Well, I believe it's a metaphysical manifestation of the Elden Ring's power. It is a nexus and focal point of the power of the Elden Ring. It governs life and death, as well as being connected to Marika, the Elden Beast, and the Elden Ring. And it is therefore no wonder that it becomes the focal point of greater will authority. And that being said, we now need to look at the other component part of the Age of the Erd Tree, and that is the Greater Well's vassal god, Queen Marika the Eternal, the vessel for the Elden Ring. As with every New Age, the Greater Well nominates certain individuals for potential godhood by marking them as Imperian. This is a process we hear about via Rani, herself once in this very position. I was once an Empyrean of the demigods. Only I, Mikola, and Melania could claim that title. Each of us was chosen by our own two fingers as a candidate to succeed Queen Marika, to become the new god of the coming age, which is when I received Blythe in the form of a vassal tailored for an Empyrean. 
Following this pattern then, Marika received Malekith when she too was elected as Imperian. And this is something we learn via Malekith's Remembrance, which reads, Malekith was a shadow-bound beast given to his Imperian. Marika's sole need of her shadow was a vessel to lock away destined death. Marika was elected as Imperian from among a people known as the Numen, a connection we make via Marika's hammer, the Black Knife Assassin armor, but most directly via the Numen rune, which outright says she is from Numen stock. The Numen are a fascinating race, and according to their appearance preset on the character creation, they are supposed descendants of denizens of another world, long lived but seldom born. So once again I turn to my friend Last Protagonist for a translation to help us better understand the nature of this race that Marika hails from. They provided a translation for the Black Knife Assassin armor, and noted that in the original Japanese the word Numen is not used, instead these people are referred to as Maribito. According to the ever-reliable Wikipedia, Maribito are as follows, an ancient Japanese word referring to a supernatural being who comes from afar, bringing gifts of wisdom, spiritual knowledge and happiness. The term refers to any one of a number of divine beings who were believed to visit villages in Japan, either from beyond the horizon or from beyond distant mountain ranges, bringing gifts. So this additional context from Last Protagonist reinforces the idea that the Numen are not normal beings from this world that we inhabit now. They live supernaturally long and are overall alien to this world that we live in now. And indeed this alien nature can be reinforced by a further translation provided by Last Protagonist of the Night Maiden and Swordstress puppets, which reads in his words, they are a cold-blooded alien race. Now I talk about the relationship between the Numen and the Nox in a lot more detail in my Eternal Cities lore video, but in short I posit the Nox are the Numen, but now their identity is defined by their allegiance to the Age of Stars, hence the Nox, Latin for Night. Rogier refers to the Black Knife assassins as scions of the Eternal City, while the Black Knife armor refers to them as Numen. That really is the briefest of summations, and if you want the full deep dive into it, I again refer you to my Eternal Cities lore video. Regardless, this is already making Marika a really interesting character. She comes from an otherworldly race, who clearly have a different biology, given they are otherworldly, long-lived, and cold-blooded. Especially of interest is the long-lasting life, given we have two Numen connections that now use the term Eternal the Eternal Cities, and Queen Marika the Eternal. In my Eternal Cities video, I had suggested that the term Eternal was something different, possibly linked to their curse or the fact they are supposed to live eternally under a false sky as punishment, but as often happens with Elden Ring lore, I have since shifted my position and cannot deny the fact that the term Eternal is used in two instances of long-lived beings. Now we don't know why Marika was chosen to be Imperian from among her people. Perhaps she is called Queen Marika because she was already queen of these Numens, or maybe she was a powerful leader or warrior, but I do tend to lean towards the fact that she was already Queen Marika of these people. But regardless, we know the Numen are a remarkable otherworldly race, and therefore one among their number would make a very powerful god. Being raised to godhood is far more than just a title. When Marika became god, she became the vessel for the Elden Ring itself. Queen Marika is the vessel of the Elden Ring, carrier of its vision, a god in truth. Queen Marika does literally carry the Elden Ring within her, as we see by it appearing in Radigan Marika's shared body at the end of the game. It clearly became part of her, as when she shatters the Elden Ring in the announcement trailer, we can see that she shatters herself at the same time. The Greater Well will have needed Marika to operate as its proxy in the Lands Between, for the Erd Tree would face great opposition to its ascension, and it required a god of unshakable power to cement its dominion over the world. 
and so Marika would brandish the power of the Elden Ring, and to assist in this matter, she would take her consort, Hora Lu, henceforth known as Godfrey, the first Elden Lord. This is evidently a calculated move, and a necessary one, given the times that Marika lived in. She was aware that to cement her godhood, and the age of the Erd Tree, she would need martial might, and who better to help her secure this than the mighty Hora Lu, Lord of the Battlefield. As we discussed in detail in prior chapters, the arrival of the Erd Tree will not have been viewed positively for many people. It was a threat to people's ways of life, and many will not have taken kindly to the implication of the Erd Tree's arrival. As such, Godfrey was an excellent choice for Lord, and I believe both Elden Lords, Radigan and Godfrey, are a sign of the times. Godfrey is the world's mightiest warrior at a time of great conflict, and Radigan is a man strong of belief in a time of waning faith. Of course, we will discuss Radigan shortly. Joining Godfrey would be the Crucible Knights, and we learn of these warriors from the Crucible Axe Helm, which reads, Helm of the Crucible Knights, who served Godfrey, the first Elden Lord, holds the power of the Crucible of Life, the primordial form of the Erd Tree. As we have already discussed, the age of the Crucible will have overlapped with the age of the Erd Tree, and at this stage, the power of the Crucible will still have been seen as divinity, and as such, the Crucible Knights will have been the foremost warriors for the Erd Tree in this early era. So with such might at her command, Marika would look to secure her new holdings as a god and brandish the very power of the Elden Ring against the most dangerous threat that existed, the Fire Giants. So again, this is a subject that I have covered in detail in my Legacy of Fire lore video, and I don't want to make this long video longer than it needs to be, so I won't go into detail about the actual battles and details of the war against the giants, but it is important to analyse from Marika's perspective what happened in this war, because a lot of what would happen would shape the culture of the Erd Tree and Marika's rule itself. We know that the decision to make war upon the fire giants was a logical one. Not only were they a powerful race that worshipped a god that fell outside the purview of the greater will, but they actually posed a danger to the emergent Erd Tree. We learn this via the Surge O Flame incantation, which tells us that the Flame of Ruin was capable of burning the Erd Tree, therefore making it one of the few direct physical threats to the Erd Tree. We know that people of Erd Tree faith, prophets, would have visions of the Flame of Ruin burning down the Erd Tree throughout history. For example, we hear of this dire prophecy via the Catch Flame incantation, which reads, Incantation originating from a sinister prophecy. The Flame of Ruin is anathema, to the Erd Tree, but prophets sometimes glimpse it within the faith all the same. Sadly, when this occurs, their sole reward is banishment. So this of course is the background story to the Prophet starting class, one of the many bits of lore that I discuss in my starting class lore video, which I will link below. What is interesting is that the incantation describes the Flame of Ruin as anathema, which as a term, when used in a religious or organisational context, means something denounced or deemed an abhorrence to said faith. Its very existence, therefore, was in opposition to the Erd Tree just by its existence, and its allegiance to another god, the Fell God, meant it was something that could never be incorporated by the Rising Order. And indeed, the Roar Medallion Talisman describes the giants as mortal enemies of the Erd Tree, and so it seems, they were always destined to do battle for supremacy of the lands between. It is unclear whether prophets existed at this time, and it was visions like this that informed the decision of Queen Marika to wage war, or whether it was just a logical conclusion based on what she already knew of their people. At this stage, the conviction of Marika is pretty clear, that she fully believed in the mission of the Erd Tree, and was strong in her faith and utterly without mercy for her enemies. And we can gather this from the speech that Melina recreates for us at the first church of Marika on the mountaintops of the giants. In Marika's own words, Hark, brave warriors. Hark, my Lord Godfrey. We commend your deeds. 
guidance hath delivered ye through each ordeal to the place ye stand. Put the giants to the sword and confine the flame atop the mount. Let a new epoch begin, an epoch glistening with life. Brandish the Elden Ring for the age of the Erd Tree. One thing of particular interest in this speech to me is the use of the term brandish that Marika uses in regards to the Elden Ring. The word brandish is usually used in reference to a weapon being wielded, therefore suggesting that the Elden Ring, its power, was actually wielded as a weapon in this battle. And given the way that Radigan uses the power of the Elden Ring in the final battle, we can only imagine Marika at the height of her power. And I do think this is one of the most incredible and interesting things about Marika, is we hear so much about her, but we never see her at the height of her domain or the height of her powers. And we can only imagine what a terrible force she would have been to meet on the battlefield while brandishing the power of the Elden Ring. Combining this immense power with Godfrey, the Crucible Knights, the Betrayal of the Trolls and the Zamor, Marika had tipped the scales so far in the Erd Tree's favour that the giants really had no chance. The way in which she deals with the last surviving member of the fire giant race once again tells us a great deal about Marika's ruthlessness when it came to her enemies at this early stage. I of course refer to the information found within the fire giant's remembrance which reads as follows. The fire giant is a survivor of the war against the giants. Upon realising the flames of their forge would never die, Queen Marika marked him with a curse. O oh, trifling giant, mayst thou tend thy flame for eternity. Now before anyone says, I'm not judging Marika for being ruthless. War is war at the end of the day, and generals need to make a lot of difficult decisions. I'm only making this disclaimer because in my Golden Order and Gold Mask video, I had a couple of comments where people believed I was passing judgement when I described how Gold Mask perceived the fickleness of the gods. I admire Marika greatly and have a great deal of empathy for the position she is in as the god of a difficult era. Regardless, objectively, her treatment of the last giant is a calculated one. Realising there was no way to smother the flame of ruin completely, there was no benefit in killing the last giant. In fact, as we learned from Burn o Flame, killing him would have actually been a mercy, as death is the only way to break the curse. The curse of being destined to tend the flame forever. Instead, Marika uses this curse to her benefit, condemning him to a life of solitary duty. He is the last of his kind, and he has to endure this period by himself, knowing that the rest of his race has been extinguished. His duty, his curse, is tending to the flame, and him being there having to tend this flame in a practical sense serves as a last obstacle for anyone who wants to access the Flame of Ruin, and in that way Marika is very smart in keeping him alive just in case someone tries to access the Flame of Ruin. The War of the Giants would have an everlasting and indelible effect on Earth Tree culture, especially as it pertains to their perception of fire. Fire would remain reviled and feared, something we learn about via the Spark Aromatic, which reads, art of the perfumers who fought in the Shattering. Though fire was prohibited to those who served the Earth Tree, this rule was forgotten as the war drew ever on. The fear of the flame conjured by the conflict with the giants and the fear of their flame of ruin would integrate itself into Earth Tree culture, being a forbidden tool, and the burning of the Earth Tree would of course become the first cardinal sin of the Earth Tree faith and those that had the prophecies of the burning of the earth tree and would begin to brandish fire incantations were of course banished from its society. Regardless, the charismatic and powerful Queen Marika had defeated the giants, and is told by the sword memorial found on the mountaintops, this is what marked the beginning of the age of the earth tree proper. The age of the crucible was over. Through Marika, the greater will had established a powerful foothold on the mortal plane, anchored by the power of the Erd Tree. The first church of Marika would be established at the site of the Erd Tree's greatest victory, on the mountain tops of the giants, 
and in time many churches to the new god would be erected, and in general the faith would spread beyond the lands between. As a god with a human lord as her husband, Marka would have the first of her children, and these would be the children born of Godfrey, known as the Golden Lineage, to which we can tie Godwin the Golden, Moog, Morgoth, and eventually Godric, though the latter is several generations separated from the rest. And Marka and her Golden Lineage would become emblematic of these heady days of the Erdtree and central to the pantheon of the Erdtree royal family. What would follow would be the golden age of abundance, which must have been an incredible period to witness, and an age that reinforced Marka's own belief in the Erdtree's grace. And so with that said, let us examine these good old days, the Age of Plenty. The greatest lore item in the game, the Albanoric Blood Clot, says the following. Albanorics are life forms made by human hands, thus many believe them to live impure lives untouched by the Erdtree's grace. Now the implication of this is that the Erdtree would become the centre, the focal point, for all natural life. And in no time was this better illustrated than the so-called Age of Abundance. We can learn of this interesting period of Erdtree history from the incantation Erdtree Heal, which reads as follows. The Erdtree once flourished with abundance, yet it was only for a fleeting moment. Such is the course of all life. This period of abundance seems to be the heady early days of the age of the Erd Tree, when the bounty of the Erd Tree spilled from it like apples from a fruit tree. As keenly observed by my fellow tarnished Erdin, speculatively, we can see engravings commemorating this period of plenty at the Chapel of Anticipation and above the door of the real round table hold. The reliefs identified by Erdin show people carrying vessels that are similar in appearance to ancient Greek amphorae, and these were traditionally used to store wine, oil, milk or grain, and it was symbolic of plenty or abundance. To me this lines up with the symbolism shown on the icon shield and the blessed dew talisman. Both the item descriptions of these items describe this age of plenty. For example, the blessed dew talisman reads as follows. Talisman depicting a drop of the Erdtree's sap, a blessed boon. It was once thought that the blessed sap of the Erdtree would drip from its boughs forever, but that age of plenty swiftly came to a close, and with time, the Erdtree became more an object of faith. Again we are getting direct reference to this age of plenty, but that it only lasted a brief time, clearly in the opening years of the Erdtree's emergence from the Crucible. To me, this early period of abundance makes sense, logically, as the Erdtree emerged from the crucible of all life, a focus of chaotic life energy, and this blessed dew is almost a remnant of the life from which the Erdtree has emerged. However, this was clearly finite, which makes sense as the Erdtree is more representative and symbolic of a period of regression, an age where the chaotic, uncontrollable life found within the crucible made way for an age where life is to settle and pull towards the mean. We get further evidence of the bounty or dew being tied to the residual energies of the crucible from the amber medallions. They all read the following. The Erd Tree's old sap becomes amber, treasured as the most precious jewels in the age of Godfrey, the first Elden Lord. A primordial life energy resides inside. And indeed, these were not just aesthetically pleasing relics, the sap or amber has some real power, as we can see by the fact that these talismans boost our vitality in varying ways, imbuing us with the power of life contained within, the primordial life force once found within the crucible. The word choice of primordial is clearly linking this to the crucible, the primordial source of life. And thus I think this period, this Age of Abundance or Age of Plenty, is an overlap period between the Age of the Crucible and the Age of the Earth Tree, where the energies of the Crucible are still flowing and bursting forth from the Earth Tree before it settles into the Age of the Earth Tree proper. The power and strength of the vitality that bled from the Earth Tree in this early era of its emergence not only took the form of sap, 
but seemingly the tree itself exuded an aura, as we learn from the warming stone item, which reads as follows. It's said that the earth tree was once as warm as the gentle sun, and would gradually heal all who bathed in its rays. In paintings of the earth tree from what we presume to be the early days, we see it bursting with rays of light, and the use of the word sun is also interesting, because there's evidence to suggest that the energy of the earth tree was so potent that Lanedale was once referred to as the seat of the sun. This is something we gleam from the Sun Realm shield, and we can find these shields on these skeletons found outside Lanedale itself. And I think what cements that it is talking about Lanedale in this Sun Realm shield is that the description is in line with all descriptions of the Age of Plenty, i.e. it was fleeting, and this Age of Sun has long since passed. And while the Earth Tree does still give off a massive ray of light, it is nothing compared to the luster that we see in some of these paintings of the Earth Tree of old. In general, and in totality, the vision we have of this Age of Plenty is one of positivity, vitality, and bounty. Clearly, faith wasn't much of a challenge at this point because the rewards and benefits were so plentiful and obvious to see. And indeed, in early Earth Tree society, it appears that Queen Marika herself would come down and present blessings to her people in person, something we learn of from the Earth Tree's favourite talisman, which reads, It is said that when the age of the Earth Tree began, such blessings were personally bestowed upon their recipients by Queen Marika herself. I just find this to be another positive scene that depicts the heady days of the early Earth Tree rule, where Marika herself interacted with her people and blessed them. And as said, I think that the reason this period is so fleeting is because it is a transitional period between the Crucible and Earth Tree, and you could either see it as the late era of the Crucible or the early era of the Earth Tree, and I see it as a combination of both. And once the residual energy of the faded Crucible had gone, that is when the blessings stopped. Much like with Anor Londo in Dark Souls, it is nice to think of Dell and the Erd Tree as the shattered remains of something truly beautiful. In both cases, we are blown away by the beauty of these fallen civilizations, even at their lowest points, and it is almost beyond our comprehension, the splendor of Dell and the Erd Tree in these days of pure bliss and wonder. And we can only look at paintings, old paintings, and wonder what once was. But with those heady days behind us, we need to now get to the core of who Marika is. And of course, we cannot do this without analysing the big twist of Elden Ring that Marika is equal to Radigan. And so now let us examine the immortal Rebus. The Golden Order is founded on the principle that Marika is the one true god. However, the name of Marika's second husband, King Consort Radigan, also appeared. Who exactly was Radigan? So let's just get to it, the big revelation for us all on our first playthrough. Marika is equal to Radigan. They are two individual beings in one body, yet of course they are two distinctly different personalities, both with their own ideals and their own actions. I think a lot of people struggle with this concept and what the point of it is, because it is fairly unceremoniously dumped on you, without really explaining the how or the why. While a lot of questions will continue to be unanswered, then you fight Elden Beast and the game's over. So I'll do my best to share my understanding of it, and what I perceive to be the truth of the Marika Radigan question. To understand it truly is to understand both the laws of regression revered by the Golden Order, and to understand the ideal of the Rebus, the ultimate end goal of alchemy. I talk in this My Golden Order video, but one of the tenets of the Golden Order fundamentalism is the idea of regression, a type of convergence. We have already discussed how the principles of regression illustrate how the fundamentalists envision a more refined, tighter concept of life, where the outliers are pulled closer towards the norm. However, the law of regression actually goes further than this, as it says, Regression is the pool of meaning, that all things yearn eternally to converge. This idea of convergent is actually one really well explored by the Dead Space trilogy, and if for some bizarre reason you haven't played those games, please drop everything right now and go and play them. But in essence, it seems as though the underlying concepts of the Golden Order 
is that life should be getting closer to convergence, that they should be pulling together and there should be less disparity in all forms of life. And this is why the idea of an Erd tree burial, of life being absorbed and returned to the Erd tree, is very critical to the law of regression, as it is life returning to the Erd tree, becoming one with the Erd tree and removing that disparity. And once we comprehend this idea, we start to see the pull of things in many things related to the Erd tree and the Golden Order. Intelligence and faith pulling together to create the Golden Order incantations. Radigan studying faith and incantations to become complete. Twins, D and his brother, who have converged to share one soul. And of course, the two beings who share one body, the ultimate representation of convergence, the god of the Golden Order. This idea of two beings sharing one body, one male and one female, is an alchemical theory said to be the great work of the field, the rebus, the magnum opus of any alchemist. It is a metaphor for the alchemical process as a whole, the bringing together and purification of two things to create something better. I believe the Golden Order is alchemical in its ideals, the blending of things together to make something better, and thus this immortal rebus of Marika and Radigan is the very pinnacle of life as described by the laws of regression and causality represented by the soul Erd tree itself, and the convergence of all life to the Erd tree through Erd tree burial. As a result, Radigan and Marika's combined form is fitting, as they represent the pinnacle of the laws espoused by those who study the Erd tree and the Golden Order meaning this form must be somehow connected to the underlying mathematics and form of the Elden Ring. It also makes sense that Radigan would be pushing the ideals of fundamentalism, given he knows the true end result of the law of regression. So I now need to speak on what I believe to be the truth behind their origins as a rebus and when it happened. As there are a lot of ideas as to when it happened, I used to think it happened when they were married, and some people believe that happened when the shattering actually occurred, but I'm going to give my view on what I believe happened. These are all valid ideas, as it all is just speculation, but I'm going to give what I think makes the most sense to the surrounding lore. Upon studying this subject and looking at all the surrounding lore, I believe that Marika became a rebus upon the moment of her ascension to godhood, that Radigan has always been part of her history as a god. I don't believe that they were two individuals that later merged at some point, and I believe that Radigan has always existed as a part of Marika, but not vice versa, as Marika, in my opinion, was not born a Rebus. We know that she wasn't always a god, that she was once a Newman, and I believe aside from the unusual nature of Newman, she was just a Newman woman, or queen, called Marika. She was then selected to become an Empyrean, and then became a god of a new era upon defeating the Giants. I've always pondered on the relevance of Radigan's hair. As we learn from the giant's red braid, Radigan associated his hair with the red hair of the giants and I've always found this item description curious because it implies he is somehow linked to the fire giants. And now I ponder, could it be that this is an imprint of this conflict between Marika and the fire giants, that upon her ascension to godhood and the creation of her other half, Radigan, did they somehow leave an imprint on Radigan? Or should I say, her Radigan half? That is of course just colourful speculation, so let's get into the real reasons why I believe that Radigan and Marika were always a rebus from the moment she became a god. Firstly, there are the ideals of regression and convergence that we've already discussed. When we talked about the Erd tree, we talked about how it's intrinsically linked to the Elden Ring, and how its changes to the Elden Ring affected the Erd tree. So when Marika became the vessel for the Elden Ring, and became intrinsically linked to the Elden Ring, does it not make sense that the Elden Ring could affect who Marika was down to her DNA? We know the ideals of Law of Regression and Law of Causality are underpinned by the Golden Order's interpretation of the Elden Ring. If the Elden Ring's form is a metaphysical representation of regression and convergence, does this mean it could have transformed Marika to also represent the ideal, given they are now linked. I certainly think so. Secondly, in history, Radigan just seems to appear 
at the time of the Laernian Wars, and made massive decisions such as making peace with the Carians through marriage, decisions really only Marca should be making given she's the leader of the Erdtree forces. How was he able to make these massive decisions? Returning to the Carian betrothal, I think this is also a stage that gives us a lot of evidence that Radigan was already Marca at this stage, and it wasn't something that happened later, either at the time of Marca Radigan's marriage, or at the time of the Shattering. Because first of all we have the Mask of Confidence, the Mask of the Preceptors who served Renala. The mask reads as follows. When Radigan married Renala, he ordered the Carrion Magic Preceptors to don these masks, to make it clear that all of their matters were to be kept strictly private. This seems to give off the vibe that Radigan had something massive to hide, a big deep secret. And what else could it really be when we're talking about Radigan? Meaning that he was already Marka at this time, and the preceptors were to keep that fact hidden. This also seems to be the same secret that Muriel describes him hiding when talking about the statue that was created by a sculptor in Lane Dale. You know, it's said that Lord Radigan harboured a secret. A famed sculptor of the Erdtree capital was once summoned to render Lord Radigan's likeness in giant stature when he glimpsed the skeleton in Radigan's closet. And as such, it's said the great statue harbours his secret too. And to cement that Radigan was always Marka, even at the stage of his marriage to Renala, there's the fact he leaves Renala a fragment of the Elden Ring. The Amber Egg, that is what the Amber Egg is. Again, how would Radigan, a mere champion, have access to such a powerful artifact? In addition, Muriel makes some interesting and pointed claims about the bizarre nature of Radigan's ascension, his abandonment of Renala, and his marriage to Marika. However, when Godfrey, first Elden Lord, was hounded from the lands between, Radigan left Renala to return to the Erdtree capital, becoming Queen Marika's second husband and King Consort, taking the title of Second Elden Lord. The mystery endures to this day as to why Lord Radigan would cast Lady Renala aside, and moreover, why a mere champion would be chosen for the seat of Elden Lord. And if you think about it, he is right. It is totally bizarre that Radigan basically upsticks, abandons his family, seemingly on a whim. It is also strange that it would be a mere champion, for that is what Radigan is, chosen out of nowhere to be elevated to Elden Lord after Godfrey left the Lands Between. Yet all of this would then make sense if Radigan and Marika were always one, and Radigan's ascension is him essentially supporting his other half when a new Elden Lord was needed. Of course, one of the other aspects of the Rebus is that it is two different elements coming together, and so just because Marika and Radigan share one body, and Radigan's actions can be explained by him also being part of Marika, doesn't mean they aren't also individual. So I think when people have a problem comprehending that they were always a Rebus, it's due to the fact that we have actions attributed to Radigan and to Marika. So to make it clear they aren't the same person, they are two different personalities inhabiting one body, and as we can see from the final fight, they could clearly switch between different personalities, meaning that Radigan would go and do things that would be attributed to him, and Marika would go and do things that were attributed to her. And if no one saw the transformation, no one would know they were the same person. I think what also causes some confusion is Marika's line in the Queen's bedchamber that Melina can recreate for us. So let's listen to that now and we'll break it down. In Marika's own words, O oh Radigan, leal hound of the Golden Order, thou art yet to become me. Thou art yet to become a god. Let us be shattered. Both. Mine other self. So in this dialogue, Marika says, Thou art not yet me. And people take this to mean that they aren't yet conjoined. When, again, I think this is a critical misunderstanding of what a rebus is. Because they are two wholly individual people. They just share one body. And so when Marika says, Thou art not yet me, I think she is implying the fact that she is still the true god, not Radigan. 
Radigan is merely her Elden Lord. And then she goes on to say, mine other self, which to me again cements the fact that Radigan is already part of Marika at this stage. And this is why in the introductory cinematic, we see it flashing between Marika and Radigan. It's both halves vying for control of their shared body. And we can learn of this fight from Marika's hammer description, which reads as follows. Stone hammer made in the lands of the Numen, outside the lands between. The tool with which Queen Marika shattered the Elden Ring and Radigan attempted to repair it. So they both wrestled for control of their body as Marika tried to shatter the ring and Radigan tried to undo her damage. Yet obviously we know what happens. Marika won out, she shattered the Elden Ring, and then they were both imprisoned by the Elden Beast. But to prevent his Olden Order from being usurped, Radigan would then put these spiny briars and his seal on the entrance to the Erd Tree. His loyalty to the Golden Order so blind that he'd rather keep a shattered world than allow someone to repair it. Something not even the Greater Will expects as they are stunned into silence after we are denied entrance to the Elden Ring. The battle between the two halves of the Rebus is what sets into motion the events of the game. As we see from the introductory cinematic of the game, Queen Marika has not been seen since the shattering of the Elden Ring and no one in the outside world knows her involvement in breaking the Elden Ring. She has just vanished and the lands between are plunged into chaos. So I think that's a sufficient explanation of what my understanding of what Marika is and what she did, but why did she do it? To try and understand this, let us move on to the final portion of this video essay where we actually analyse who Marika was as a human, as a person, and how far her discontent goes. One of the things that I find interesting when we're looking at Marika is the statues we see of her throughout the world, including the one at the first Church of Marika, showing her in a crucified position. This means one of two things, and firstly the most obvious, yet I believe incorrect answer, is that these statues were sculpted after Marika was crucified. However, this doesn't make sense as how would people know she's crucified, given she has disappeared and no one has seen her. Now, Queen Marika the Eternal is nowhere to be found. I would instead like you to consider another idea. These statues are symbolic of her burden as a god. To support this idea, let us look at Marika's source seal, which reads as follows. Solemn duty weighs upon the one beholden, not unlike a gnawing curse from which there is no deliverance. It is easy to forget that Marika, while a mighty god in her time, was ultimately once a human, or close enough at least, who inherited an incredible burden as described by this source seal. I think that one of the main underlying factors of Marika's decisions is due to the incredible burden that weighs her down over time, as perfectly represented by her statuary, and at the same time a series of unfortunate events begin to occur that will have broken her down over time. Some accuse Marika of being this kind of Machiavellian bad guy who always planned to bring down the greater will, but I never really got that impression and without them really knowing Marika I'm not sure how they can rush to that conclusion. I think it's a bit of a Machiavellian stereotype, and I always saw Marika as a more human character. I believe her early speeches where she is clearly supporting the Erd Tree and the Greater Will are very earnest and very impassioned. Instead I see her as a fairly tragic character bound by her duty, who experiences tragedy after tragedy, difficulty after difficulty, that eventually would lead her to question her own duty that she is bound to and being bound to the Erd Tree. There was the War of the Dragons, when the ancient dragons themselves attacked Laendale, headed by the mighty dragon Gransax. While Laendale was ultimately successful in repelling this attack, the Bolt of Gransax describes how the dragons brought great destruction to the capital, and the scars of this conflict still remain. There was also the Godskin Apostasy, a subject I have tackled in numerous videos, so again I won't let this video go on longer than need be. But suffice it to say, this was a real challenge to her authority, and I truly believe it will have shaken her to the core. Here was a force that intended to kill her and her kin, 
after no doubt centuries of her being certain in her power and immortality, and the same for her golden lineage and family. To compound her pain, the Glomide Queen, the leader of the Apostles, was an Empyrean chosen by the Fingers, as stated by the Black Flame Ritual Incantation, which reads as follows. It is said that she was an Empyrean chosen by the Fingers. This is a confusing bit of lore, and it means that the Glomide Queen was set up to be a god to take Marika's place. And we have to ask, was it a Greater Will's Fingers that chose her? While we know that other forces can command fingers, like the three fingers of the Frenzied Flame, the most numerous fingers that we know about are the two fingers of the Greater Will. Does this mean it was the Greater Will that chose the Glomide Queen to replace Marika? And if so, how would this make Marika feel? That she's disposable? Replaceable? Not only was she meant to be usurped by this Glomide Queen, she was meant to be killed by her. Either way, Marika did come out on top of this engagement by using Malekith to seal away Death's and Death, but one of the major results of it was the isolation of Death by Malekith and the creation of the Golden Order, a world without Death. This deathless world would set the stage for a massive flaw in the Golden Order, and it would be revealed by the next earth-shaking event in Marika's reign, the Knight of the Black Knives. Now, there are plenty of theories on Marika's involvement in this event, and no matter where you fall in the debate, the result is always really the same. It helped further fracture the flawed Golden Order, and it helped push Marika over the edge and shatter the Elden Ring. For those unfamiliar with the debate surrounding the Knight of the Black Knives, there is a prevailing theory that Marika had a hand in it. And for a more in-depth look at that theory, I'd refer you to my good friend Ashen Hollow's video on that very subject. The item in question that is central to this theory is the Black Knife Armour, which reads the following. The assassins that carried out the deeds of the Knight of the Black Knives were all women, and rumoured to be Numen who had close ties with Marika herself. So of course, understandably, many people read this as the close ties to Marika, meaning that they are Marika's servants, or Marika's people, who carried out the assassination of Godwin at her behest. I have come to the conclusion that the language used here is purposefully ambiguous, and therefore it is unclear what we are meant to definitively know as the truth. To try and better understand the intention behind the item description, I did ask last protagonist to translate it, and they provided the following translation. The assassins who perpetrated the night of the conspiracy were all female, and one theory says that they were Numen close to Marika. So I find this version of the translation to be more useful in making it clear that this connection is not clear, that it is rumour, as it uses the term one theory. And then looking at the English translation in tandem with this translation, the English one uses rumoured to be Numen who had close ties with Marika herself. So while it does make it more clear that this is just a rumour and not definitive fact, it also does nothing to disprove the theory that Marika was involved, and I totally accept that I have to take this theory as a serious one, given the language used here. It's also kind of backed up by Marika's perceived attitude towards her demigod children, as there are two bits of dialogue that reveal that Marika really sees her children as tools. One from purportedly Marika herself, recreated by Melina. In Marika's own words, hear me. Demigods, my children, beloved, make of thyselves that which he desire. Be it a lord, be it a god, but should ye fail to become aught at all, ye will be forsaken, amounting only to sacrifices. And then we have one given to us by a ghost witness in the Weeping Peninsula. And thus many feel that she wouldn't think twice about sacrificing her own son to strike back against the greater will and expose the flaw of those that live in death. My personal opinion on it is, it doesn't matter, because I think that Marika's real reason for shattering the Elden Ring 
is because she became aware of the Golden Order's flaw that was revealed by the Knight of the Black Knives. Whether she's behind the event or not, I still believe it is the final event that pushes her to shatter the Elden Ring as it lays bare the flaws at the heart of the Golden Order. There is another dialogue of Marika where she vows to search the depths of the Golden Order as if to better understand it and allay the doubts and fears that were beginning to plague the lands between. In Marika's own words, I declare mine intent to search the depths of the Golden Order through understanding of the proper way. Our faith, our grace is increased. Those blissful early days of blind belief are long past. My comrades, why must ye falter? It is easy to understand what these doubts may very well be, and as I discussed in my Golden Order video, the biggest mistake Marika makes is having the Rune of Death confined, because at this stage the world became a deathless nightmare. Every human we see in this world is grey, hollow, desiccated, and generally pretty miserable looking. This is the result of no death, and this is something we learn from the aristocrat set, worn by the zombie-like wandering nobles, and its description reads as follows. Abandoning their birthplace after the shattering, these undead wanderers are the pitiful product of unending life. Given the miserable state of the zombie-like inhabitants of the world, no wonder America begins to notice that this isn't right, and intends to search the depths of the Golden Order for an answer, much like Goldmask later would. There's a really great post by Ha that goes into the connections between North mythology and Marika, but what's of interest to me is the fact they point out the different tablets in Marika's room, in the Queen's Chamber area, and I have always wondered what these tablets are. Ha links the aforementioned dialogue of Marika to these tablets, saying that this is evidence of her study of the Golden Order, and ultimately she came to a conclusion that she did not like, that pushed her to the end result of shattering the Elden Ring. This is a really thoughtful reddit post with some good connections to North mythology as well that I just didn't cover in this video, so if you'd like a look at that I will link the entire reddit post in the description below, so thanks to Ha for that information. So in summary, the Godskin apostasy pushes Marika to confined death and death, the world becomes a miserable deathless hell, Marika notices the declining faith of her comrades and she herself has doubts, and so she plums the depths of the Golden Order to find an answer, and yet in there she finds no good answer, and she either organises the Knight of the Black Knives, or she does not, but either way the death of Godwin and the spread of death through throughout the land reveals the critical flaw in the Elden Ring, and thus she shatters it. And this brave decision, even fighting against her leal other half, would cost her dearly. And so it's with a heavy heart I must discuss the final tragic fate of Queen Marika. I find Marika's martyring and her treatment by the Greater Will to be one of the more brutal aspects of the game, and the only thing that makes it a little better for me is that she's not completely powerless and seems to still have some skin in the game, so to speak. That said, to complete Marika's story, you do need to consider the brutality of her final fate. When you ask Inea about Marika's treatment, the fingers say the following on Marika. Marika's trespass demanded a heavy sentence, but even in shackles, she remains a god and a vision's vessel. Confer great runes to become Elden Lord and join Queen Marika as her consort. The fingers have willed it so. Now consider what the Greater Well is actually saying and asking of us here. Marika, despite being a broken, shattered shell, is still to remain the vessel of the Elden Ring in her corpse-like, shattered form. Additionally, we're to marry this form and rule on as a proxy, condemning her to an eternity of being nothing more than a container. What a tortured and bleak existence. This punishment does not fit the crime, and you could think that the Greater Will could find a new vessel, a new god, for their Elden Ring. Yet as mentioned, it does seem as though Marika has taken some steps, and isn't completely powerless. 
It appears Marika placed Hugh in Round Table Hold to kill a god, to kill her, to put her out of her misery, as it seems that Hugh has made some kind of promise to Queen Marika. So with that context, let us consider the endings of Elden Ring that you can choose. As with this analysis in hand, it does now seem that the four Elden Lord endings are really the worst for Marika. I personally like the Dustborn ending the best, but after thinking about it, I can't help but feel great sorrow for Marika's ultimate fate. For even if I'm giving relief to those who live in death by bringing them in to the new order, Marika would be condemned to exist solely as a husk for the Elden Ring. And therefore you can't think but the frenzied flame ending would be better, because at least in that circumstance she would melt away. One final puzzle piece remains in regards to Marika for me, and this is Gideon's purported relationship with Queen Marika. As we learn the following from his armour set, Knowledge begins with the recognition of one's ignorance, the realisation that the search for knowledge is unending. But when Gideon glimpsed into the will of Queen Marika, he shuddered in fear at the end that should not be. So we know that Gideon has much closer contact with the Two Fingers and greater will, as is told to us by the Divine Fortification Incantation. His armour set appears to imply that he has somehow communed with Marika and her will, as shown by him confronting us near the end of the game. Despite him claiming throughout the game that he also wishes to ascend to the Elden Throne, he bars your way at the end because he believes Marika does not want this, that she in fact wants us to struggle for eternity. Ah, I knew you'd come to stand before the Elden Ring, to become Elden Lord. What a sad state of affairs. I commend your spirit, but alas, none shall take the throne. Queen Marika has high hopes for us, that we continue to struggle. Unto eternity. While this may be confusing, I see this as Gideon being part right in Marika's objectives, but ultimately he has peered into something he doesn't truly understand. Knowledge begins with the recognition of one's ignorance. Marika is a god, and a god who's essentially imprisoned and basically for all intents and purposes dead. I believe by touching her will, he is interpreting something so eldritch and cosmic that he's only pulled certain emotions from it. I think he is part right in that he has interpreted that Marika doesn't want anyone to become the new Elden Lord. As we've just discussed, this is a pretty horrible fate for Marika, so why on earth would she want that? But other actions of hers do seem to belay the fact that she does want us to reach her in the Erd Tree and bring an end to her suffering. She places Hugh in Round Table Hold, so that we may slay a god. She also seems to have repurposed Melina, her possible daughter, to assist the Tarnished in making it to the Erd Tree. Bear in mind that Gideon has reached into a being that is actually comprised of two individual halves. Perhaps it is actually Radigan's will that he has interpreted incorrectly. Radigan doesn't want anyone to ascend to the Elden Throne, and in fact wants nothing to change. He does want us to struggle for eternity, and to have everyone barred from entering the centre of the Erd Tree. I think that Gideon has peered into the will of churning emotions of a conflicted god of two halves, and misinterpreted the true message. Yes, Marika doesn't want anyone to become Elden Lord, but she does want us to come and put an end to her suffering. And so I plead with you, tarnished, for the love of all that is good, take a sword from Hugh and put an end to Queen Marika's eternal suffering. So thanks guys, that is my take on Queen Marika and my goodness what a, what a long video that was actually probably about half an hour longer until I cut out some fat. So if you think there's little bits that are missing, there probably is and I probably did have it, but it's on the cutting room floor at the end of the day. This video is getting absurdly large and I am very tired. <laughs> if you like this video, please consider giving it a subscribe and a like as I do primarily cover Elden Ring long form content. If you'd like to support the channel in other ways, I do have a Patreon and channel memberships and I'll hopefully be doing extra content for members and patrons soon, probably starting with a review of Vati Vidya's Soul Arts. But until next time guys, leave your comments below, what are your thoughts on Queen Marika? This was one of the most challenging subjects for me and I struggled a while with this. It really is a challenging and thought provoking subject and I came to the conclusion we're not meant to fully understand it but I've done my best to give you my all in trying to get a little bit of comprehension of what the Erd Tree is 
and what Marika's role was and who she was as a person. And I think I definitely know more about her after doing this video. But yeah, let me know what you want me to cover next, guys. I'm planning to do the Prince of Death next, followed by the Omen. But if there's anything else you'd want to make me pick up, then please leave a comment. But until next time, guys, I'm going to get some sleep. So I will see you at the foot of the Erd Tree. Take care and have a lovely night.